All right, guys, welcome once again for everyone that just came in. Um, so I'll start by introducing myself because uh, both of us were new faces here for you guys at least and for some of the team as well. Uh, my name is Dan Rosendahl. I'm the uh, newest member of the sales team and I actually took over from Jesse and Maud. Maud, some of you might know from the earlier webinars, she was always here. Um, so yeah, I'm the new point of contact. If you contact us, then you'll get me on the line. So that's me. And yeah, hi everybody. My name is Leonardo Caldoni. I am, come from Italy originally. I'm here at CBE for one year almost, and I work as a computational architectural designer. And yeah, today we'll be explaining you a bit of what we do here in design. Yeah. So behind the screen, you might not be able to see him, but he's definitely here. It's Jesse van Dongen. We also might know from earlier webinars, and he'll be our moderator for the for this webinar, and he'll answer any questions you might have um, in the chat during uh, the webinar. All right. So um, for some of you, you might know our webinars are uh, something we do every month, and it's a way for us to share knowledge. We do them live on this platform uh, as you're viewing it now, but we also do them on demand. Um, so. If you missed one or if for the next one you might not be able to join, uh, we share them on our library um, and on YouTube as well. Um, like I just said, if you have any questions during this uh, webinar, ask them in the chats and uh, yes, uh, we'll see to it that they get answered. Also, at the end of the webinar, we'll have a, a Q&A for every question that you might have after. Um, the subject of the webinars that we'll be doing in the future are uh, posted on the screen. So the next one will be about software made simple. Um, so 3D printing with the software programs that we designed in house. After that, we'll have a PPVC uh, printing modular uh, finished apartments. And this one will be in Dutch. Um, however, it's a very exciting project that we're working on. So uh, if you're curious, please follow that as well. Maybe not the Dutch one, but it'll be on our website as well. Um, after that, we have 3D printing. Um, options so match the strategy with the printer after that behind the scenes how to design with 3d printing technology and after that on march the 28th we'll do material impacts on uh, how mortar affects your build and the environment so that's it okay um Let's see. So we'll start with a poll. Like I just said, some of you might know that we've been doing this for a while, but we were curious ourselves if any of you have already maybe watched one of our previous webinars. So we have a poll for that. We'll just let's see. There we go. So it look, looks pretty even yeah, till yeah. now. Some of you have joined us before, I see. Some of you are new. Yeah, some new faces as well, apparently. Yeah. Right, quite a lot of new people. Good to see, good to see. All right, nice. Good to see so many new faces. Thanks for joining us, guys. Like I said, if you're curious about what we talked about before, you can look it up on our library and on YouTube so you can see what information we shared before this point. And if you're curious, please follow us for the next ones as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So going a bit about the learning objectives of today, the presentation we're gonna give it's gonna be based on first explaining the difference between traditional and parametric design process applied to our workflow and gen generically to design workflows then what do parametric designs look like and how to make one and then finally in the last part we're gonna summarize a bit the the content of our presentation and explain how by using parametric design you can actually reduce costs of your process so the goal of today's webinar is understanding and explaining how to reduce design and engineering costs of designing a house. CBE is not just a provider of technology. We understand that if we want to innov innovate and implement our 3D concrete printing technology, 
we really have to weigh the, to change the way we think and to change our processes. So for this reason, we support our clients not only with the technology aspect, but also in the design process of 2D printed houses. Our methodology for that aims to increase the efficiency of the process while reducing time and costs. But in order to understand the benefits of such an approach, we need to compare it with a traditional design process. After doing that, we can then go through our methodology and understand better how this brings benefits in terms of time and cost. A design process, traditional or innovative that it is, usually consists of a series of steps where additional layers of information and detail are added on top of each other in a linear sequence that from a series of needs or requirements leads to the delivery of a built product. These steps can vary in terms of name or they can be more or less, but they usually start with a program of requirements. The program of requirements provides insight into the main properties of the design, such as structure, size, or aesthetical needs. It's basically about creating a document where wishes and needs of the client or architects are defined. Uh, needs such as the function, the location, the number or type of rooms required, but also important aesthetical or technical requirements. After this, in our process, the conceptual design phase is started. During this phase, the main architectural and structural guidelines are defined together with the first installation principles. During this phase, the main decisions are taken, but they're not fully worked out. They will detail better in the next phase. However, the development of a first conceptual design starts a first feedback loop because the design needs to be presented and agreed with the client. The client can then provide feedback, but also require for changes. This feedback loop can therefore take a variable amount of time based on the amount of changes required, and it will impact the design work, because every time it will probably need to step back and start over. This is because the information flow is mainly based on documentation. So such a documentation needs to be written every time. And this has a negative impact, of course, on the time and workload required for the design. But let's say that the conceptual phase is finalized, then we can move to the technical phase. In this technical phase, the architectural, but also the structural design are finalized together with the detailing from a technical or material perspective. Also things like the cost calculations or the construction methodology are finalized. Importantly, it's also to say that in this phase, more actors beside the architect come into play. So, for example, studies from structural engineers, MEP experts or suppliers of products need to be incorporated within the design. So basically, this starts a new feedback loop where technical design requirements can force the process to go back to a conceptual phase. Again, it's about updating and redoing documents that need to be adjusted to fit all the requirements. This again, we can imagine how much time it will take and what the impact of it can be on costs and yeah, schedules. But yeah, eventually when all these documents are finalized, it's possible to move to the operational design phase, which in our case relates strictly with our technology to the printing. In this phase, the designers will do mainly operational tasks that relate to generate final printable models or work on the planning and construction sites in order to actually be able to fit our printers. When all the steps are completed, the design is concluded and it's possible to move to the construction phase. But yeah, due to the linearity and the dependency of one step on the previous one, when something changes at the beginning of the process, this has a negative effect on the overall series of steps. So let's say that after the technical design, the client decides that he wants to have like one more, one extra room in his house. This will affect the old process that needs to start from the beginning. The inefficiency of this process becomes even more evident when we look at having multiple clients. In this case, there are two possible ways to go for. The first one is that clients are presented with a fixed program of requirements. So basically the same design process will be undertaken only once, but will generate three identical or almost identical houses. In this way, the design work is minimized, but the satisfaction of the client is at risk. The second option instead is that the program of requirements change, changes based on clients. This means that for each client, there will be a separate design process. 
that, uh, that will lead, of course, to three different houses. But we can see here how the workload will just increase together with the amount of clients, therefore also cost and time. That's where we come to the parametric design process. When we talk about parametric design, it's important to say that we're not completely changing the way we work. It's about having the same design phases, it's just that we are going to go through them with a different approach. Basically, parametric design means building a workflow which is responsive and dynamic, where different parameters of a design can easily be changed and their impact on the overall design will be taken into account. The new process, therefore, will look somehow like this. The phases are the same and we can still look at them. But the difference is that in each phase, the feedback loops we've been talking about are facilitated and incorporated within the design. Parametric design deals in each phase in different ways. In a conceptual design phase, parametric, parametric design basically means building a responsive model, which is used by users, which can be clients or architects, to actually configure their requirements into a first conceptual design. Users can change different properties, such as number of rooms, openings, positions, finishing, and they will see in real time the effects of it. What changes here is that it's not documentation to be exchanged, but just data. Documents are just generated at the end of the loop and will be the final product of conceptual design. When we look at the next phases, which are the technical and operational phase, the main the, the tools in this case become more internal and they become more parts of our set of tools. Within CBay, we use in our technical operational phase different amount of tools in the two last phases of design. For example, in technical design phase, we can look at segmenting our design into printable wall elements in an automated way. We can calculate, it, calculate things such as CO2 or material quantities in an automatic way. Instead, when we look at the operational part, where it's about generating the printable code, we are able to automatically generate our documentation, generate complex geometries such as the infill pattern we need to include in our walls, and yeah, also understand the placement of the robot on our building size in a parametric way. In this way, the same set of tools can fit different program of requirements. It's not important about the data, that, don't, that doesn't have to be the same all the time. It's just about the process that needs to be followed. So different types of data will be entered as inputs in the same process and will generate three different house design. Compared to what was shown as a traditional workflow, it's already possible to understand how this will lead to time and budget savings. Yeah. So, in particular, powerful to understand the first part of this parametric workflow because it's the one that deals also the most with clients, possible users. So it's particularly interesting to understand how parametric models can be used in conceptual design. And the next part of the webinar will be focused on how to build a parametric model and to understand better which advantages will that have for construction. Hi. So. That was Leo talking uh, a bit about the differences between the traditional and the parametric uh, design method. Um, so for this next poll, we had a question whether you are familiar with parametric design in construction. That's um, quite a funny question, of course, because obviously now you are, since Leo just explained, mm -hmm. but we were curious mm -hmm. if you knew about it before, before he did so, so brilliantly. Let's see. Let's see someone is at least here. Good to hear. Never heard of it. Oh, that's an honor then for us to explain to <laughs> it to you for the first time. That's great. Quite some people Tim. Yeah, some people have heard of it before, but they don't know exactly what it is. I hope I hope this part already helped, but we're not done yet. But Even if at this point you might have questions about what you just heard, just put them in the chat and yes, we'll look at it for you. All right, perfect. Thanks for answering guys. Uh, we'll continue with a bit more of Leo's brilliant information. 
Okay, so in this second part of the webinar, I will show you how quick and easy it is to fit a set of requirements within a parametric model and generate a conceptual design with that. This starts from, as we were saying, a program of requirements, which is usually a document like this that are here in this slide, or a table or something which makes it really hard to visualize a design. What parametric design helps us to do is actually provi to, in providing that visualization and making it easier for architects or clients. We, we see here one example of the models we use. And basically, this one in particular is based after a specific concept. So in this case, it's the house is defined around two main living areas, which are connected by a corridor. It's not possible to change the concept, but within it, it's possible to change a series of properties, such as the general dimensions of the living rooms, the type of openings, the positioning of the bathroom uh, between the two bedrooms. It's like a cooking recipe. So in this model, we can change the quantity of the ingredients, but we cannot change the result itself. It will be always a house, a house but different. So I think we can, this moment, jump to our configurator where I can show you one of these examples. We are, yeah, one second. Yes, here we are. Let me make it full screen. Yeah, so we are here in a 3D model of our house. And you can see already how it's easy to navigate and visualize. We can go on a top view, we can navigate it to the view that we prefer, and we can start playing with simple variables, like for example, showing or not showing specific elements, in this case, the roof. But then when we want to go in detail, it's possible already to adjust, for example, the dimension of our walls. And we can see how, of course, after, after some loading time, this will affect the general model we're looking at. So the speed of these changes is extremely fast. We can now change it back and then look at other parameters, which are, for example, could be the height of the wall, could be the dimension of the entrance in this case, but also when we look at this, the space parameters, we can change the width, the length of the main play, main rooms of the house, such as the bedroom, the living room, or the, um, or the toilet. So for example, if we look at the dining area, we can here change the dimension of such a space we wait and we see how this updates the model itself. The good thing about this is that we are able eventually to download a 3D model or also download an initial documentation, which help us in proceeding with the next step of the design. But now let's go back to our presentation and let's make it full screen. And yeah, let's, oops, sorry. Let's discuss a bit about how do we do this? How do we achieve this final result? It's actually through the use of a series of different platforms and softwares, but basically everything starts with the interface you see on the right side of this slide. This is Rhino 3D, our modeling software, where we do most of our design. This software is extremely good in modeling for complex geometries, such as the one we 3D print, but is also flexible enough to allow and read different various file formats. It's also the environment for our in-house slicer, Chisel. But most importantly, is the platform where we can use Grasshopper. Grasshopper is a plugin within the environment of Rhino that boosts its potential even more and allow us to actually do parametric design. It's uh, actually a user-friendly interface for visual programming, where basically tools and designs are built as algorithms or as I was saying before, as cooking recipes. So basically these designs are defined as a series of steps and relations between different objects that define a process. Inputs can change really easily and will affect the overall process and recipe basically. So we can see here 
And this gives an example of that. I'll just changing numeric values on some sliders affects the overall design. But as I was saying, this is only part of the software we use here at Siebel. Rhino, in fact, enables us also to use Chisel, which is our in-house slicer software that generates printable code. This code is then communicated with Artisan, the software, our, again, developed within Sibe that you will find on the flex pendant of any of our printers and that basically enables us to actually realize these objects. All right, and we back. So after watching Leo explain how fast this actually went and how easy it is to use, uh, we had a, another poll um, and we had actually had a question for you. Whether you would see yourself or one of your customers working with this type of designing, we're quite curious about it because it is quite new, but you just saw a couple of the advantages. So we're, we're curious. Yeah. Okay, a lot of people think uh, it's going to be helpful. Nice. Yes. Nice to see. That is nice to see, actually. Yeah, because yeah. We, we do experience that the construction industry sometimes is a bit set in its ways, right? So, yeah, yeah but, exactly. Ah, it's cool to see that people will, um, actually see the advantage of it. But yeah, it's good to, yeah, of course, we also agree that it's going to take some time for it to have like a impact on the overall world of architecture engineering. So yeah, on the sound, so that point of view. Yeah. But, but for us coupling it with the 3D printing, it yeah, actually yeah. makes things so quick and efficient. So for us, it's uh, it's amazing, but I can understand that if you use your conventional building methods that it might not be yeah. super integratable, but for us, it's amazing. We, we couldn't go without it actually, so. All right. Leo, you got, you were going to do some live yeah. live action here, right? So yeah, maybe... I think also maybe the, the video there um, wasn't like explanatory enough. So yeah, why well, then like, yeah, yeah. just share? Do some live action and what, what we'll do actually. We'll see if this works. Let's see. There we go. So what we'll do is we'll ask um, someone or maybe a couple of people to um to maybe give us some input so this is the basic design that leo has chosen to yeah. play with today but we were gonna ask you uh what would you like to change about it and leo will do it live right here and show you uh, how easy that works yeah so as i was explaining uh we have to start of course from some rules Right, so in this model we prepared, we have some general parameters, but then most importantly, I think when designing, it's the space parameters. So I think it would be nice, like if someone, I don't know, could tell us what would be the width they would like to offer the dining area. So we're looking at the left I think side. We, I think we have Ed here trying to be, uh... <laughs> Could you round the corners, uh, Leo? <laughs> <laughs> Not in this one, but <laughs> no, that, that's all good. Okay, so we have a living room width of three and a half meters. Okay, if you make that happen for us. Oh, living room width. Sorry, that's yeah. We're gonna have a length <laughs> for now of three point five, but also we're gonna have the width. So I'm gonna change this. Yeah, you see the living room is the bottom corner on the left on the floor plan. So do we have something else? Now we will just change the length back to how it was. So can we see each other? Can we see ourselves sleeping in the, the, in, in that room? Might be a bit small actually. Yeah, I don't know. Or maybe you want to have like a double single bedroom, let's say. In case there are not two, two kids in the family. Yeah, yeah. Make some room to put two beds in, maybe. Could you make that happen for us? Yeah. So let's say that here on two of a 
formula with. There we go. So yeah. Maybe, might be able to put an extra bed in. Yeah, let's so that maybe the this angle on top is a bit weird and then let's to play say, the furniture. Let's so. say maybe mom and dad get into an argument and they want to split their uh, beds apart. We might need some more room. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, That's we can increase. Uh, you, but... Yeah, we can go like the rules we set. Let's say yeah, they're gonna fight too much. Maximum is four meters. We're gonna increase in this <laughs> model the bedroom. But yeah, you see here, the, okay, the master bedroom is a bit little bit bigger now, and you see how everything is adjusting to it. So of course now the dimension of the living room is set to a specific measure. So this angle on top is changing. So this is something, for example, we would like to change. And it might be not the best place to place a wardrobe if you have such an angle. <laughs> um, yeah. But um, exactly for this reason as well is um, the parametric uh, designing so good for the 3D printing because in traditional construction, um, such an angle would be quite a big problem. Um, but then when you 3D print it, it's not that much of a problem, right? Yeah, you exactly. still like square corners in your house, obviously, but construction wise, the 3D printer doesn't really care the angle of the what yeah, the angle exactly. of the wall is. So that's why it's super compatible with the yeah. with our way of actually constructing it. So to conclude, is now time to answer the question, how could you benefit from this technology? This actually has two different point of views. The first one is, of course, from the point of view of a client and its satisfaction. This will definitely increase your parametric design due to the fact that it will be able to see the results of his program of requirements or desires in a much faster way. From the point of view of the builder or designer itself, the main benefits are in the speeds with which results can be achieved and also in the easiness with which a program of requirements can be translated into a first conceptual design, reducing the time involved into the overall process. As we saw before, with this model, it's possible to make different house design, just starting from a common concept. As you know, and as you can imagine, the investment required to develop the first parametric model is higher compared to making a standard 2D or 3D conceptual design. But because these models are so easy to adjust, the time and cost reductions will come with the second and third model and so on. With this type of models, the architects or the client themselves can build their own conceptual design in real time, starting from their needs, visualizing them like seconds afterwards. So this is revolutionary because it changes the way of approaching uh, like a list of needs and the overall process, changing it from just a list of boring documents to something visually appealing and clear. So that uh, basically the, the steps we were discussing at the beginning, again, don't change compared to what used to be traditional design. They will still need to be followed. But, and still, if something goes wrong in one of the steps, it will have an impact on the rest of them. The difference in this case is that the speed will be, the speed with which this changes will be addressed and solved is much higher. So we can see how there's like from a program of requirements, it's just about having a fluid workflow that will lead again to completion of the overall steps and to the final design. So to conclude again and to repeat what the pros and cons are of this technology, there are like positive and negative points for both organization and clients. From the client point of view, again, it's about speed, it's about flexibility and it's about having his requirements met really fast. For the organization, instead, it's about the flexibility of the model, about the changes this can bring to the overall design process. It's about reducing time by standardizing generic concept, but it's also about reducing time when dealing with changes and yeah, sudden modifications to the design. A negative aspect though, as we said, is that uh, higher time and workload investment is required to develop this initial 3D models to get it started. 
So we said that the first design might have a bigger impact on time and costs and therefore making it harder to start this process. That's where our library comes in. We, as CIBE, as we said at the beginning, don't just want to provide technology. We also want to help you improve and make this design process more efficient. If we, in fact, go to our library, you can see how here we make available a series of designs that range from furniture elements, such as planters, to house design, or even just tools that can be used and implemented within your workflow. Each of these house design represents a concept, a parametric concept that can be tweaked and tuned according to the requirements of a client. If you choose, for example, one, like the customizable row house, we can open it and then, as I was showing before, navigate within it. So if I was a potential client, the first thing I would do is opening the tab of the commands and for example, yeah, turn off the roof. In this way, I can look inside and maybe I decide that it's useful for me to see also the structural system. So we see it now. Now I can work on the configuration of my own house. So I can say that I want to change a little bit the dimensions of my house. Yes, so you see how from 3.5 meters we change the width of the design to 5 meters. This is only one of the many changes we can do. As for example, changing the dimension of a door. Maybe because we have budgeting problems, we want to reduce yeah, the, the size of the openings. And we see how here, after some loading time, the width of the door changed. Or again, maybe the height can be changed and reduced to two meters. Yes, you see how these are only some of the examples of the features that we can change in our design. So let's try another model now. Let's go back to the list. Let's say we want to choose another type of row house, for example. We can open our new model. Again, we wait until it loads and then, yes, now we can navigate around it. We see already how this model changes a bit compared to the previous one. Let's see how. Again, we turn off the roof. We see also in this case the structural frame, but what we can see here, thanks to these sliders, is that we can slide wall by wall. Basically, this design is composed right now of 16 wall elements, but if we move the slider, we can just visualize the first of these walls. And in the rest of the house, we see how the structural frame will work within our 3D printed walls. So in this case, we can go back to the old walls. Maybe what we want to change is a bit the height of those walls. Yes. So now the height is reduced for also printing time. And then, it's not only a configurator we can play with, we can actually download the 3D file from our library to your laptop. And this will download the Rhino file. What we need to do now is opening Rhino. And after that, 
open our model that we just downloaded from the library. Let's give it a moment. Yes, here we are. That's the model we were working on. We can change the visualization settings a bit. And yeah, here we are, it's a model. And it's not only about the conceptual design in this case, so not just the definition of a sleeping area, living area and toilets in the middle, but it's also about the technical aspects related to 3D printing, such as the definition of the infield system that will be printed within the walls to increase stability, or even the division that I was already mentioning when navigating on the library of the walls into a series of printed elements that can fit within the range of our printer. Therefore, this model is ready to be printed. The next step now we would need to take, if you want to realize this project, is select individually these wall elements and then using them as input for chisel. Chisel that you can see here on the right side of my screen, it's our slicer that we use developed within CBIT and that we use to generate our printable code. It's just about adding our objects and then do the magic. After that, we'll get printable codes that we'll be able to load into Artisan that I was mentioning before, which is actually the software that runs within our robots and enables us to print the design themselves. We can now go back to our presentation. And yes, one second, also to full screen mode. Because this is not all. What we also have. Oh, one second. Yes, here we are. What we can also provide with is documentation. So for all the cells design we developed, we also have a set of documents which represent a 2D drawing version of one of the possible designs that can be realized. Of course, this can change, but such a drawing base can be an interesting starting point for moving from a conceptual design to a technical phase. Sorry, let's give it a minute until it loads. Yes, here we have it. So this document is our starting drawing set when it comes to yeah choosing a design concept to work with or just to have more information about our live houses. So yeah, all the houses are defined in this, this is bridge house and some dimensions, but in general, some ideas about aesthetical qualities and general properties are explained and illustrated. So yeah, we can go now back to the presentation and this and move on. All right, perfect Leo, thank you very much for that. So after looking at this and after the rest of the webinar, we were quite interested whether you are interested so um if you would like to get in touch with us to see what this technology could do for your company uh, you'll get in touch with me um, but you can click uh, on the bottom below and then you'll get in touch with me and we can have a chat um either via email yeah i can see the button now so if you click on that button you'll get on our contact form and you get right in touch with me and then we can maybe plan a chat one-on-one uh, -on -one, or maybe one in which I could invite our CEO, Mr. Barry Hendricks, and we could talk about what we can do for you using this technology that Leo just so brilliantly explained. Um, 
that being said, we were wondering uh, after that uh, whether you have any questions for us as of right now. I will open the chat and I'll just see if there is something or someone that has a question. Um, Gerald, I see a question. So um, I think Leo might be best equipped to answer this. Um, but I can tell you right now, without having a project in mind, we can't say exactly how much. It depends on the project, but maybe Leo can yeah, explain Yeah, exactly. This I think if you're looking for like a, an amount, uh, something it really depends on a business case or a project. Yeah. But like uh, what we explained, and again, like um, what I'm going to explain again is like the, the benefits in terms of processes. So by like looking at your process and like the, the changes that we explained, then it's, it can be imagined how this and can be quantified specifically how this reduce costs. For us, uh, as I said, it's just a matter of reducing workforce and then speeding up processes. So there's, if you like, yeah, there's as direct consequences in terms of like cost. Yeah, it takes less people and it takes less yeah, time. Exactly. Right? That, that's the premise of it. it yeah. It's a shorter process, it's more an in, in, inclusive process for the customer and all the included parties. So you need less back and forth and it's more a natural process. So it's faster and it's more efficient. And that's pretty yeah, exactly. much the way to save time, right? Time is money, as they say. Um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, accordingly, Gerald, um, are the walls you build load bearing or you build separate structure? Uh, both actually, but uh, yeah. yeah so this is more like the technical design question. Like uh, because of like building codes, uh, as of now, most places we we have to realize for safety a uh, traditional RC frame. So what we avoid is the costs and labor related to formwork, basically. What we print are walls, which are both separation, but also formwork for a, a fr structural frame that could be concrete or could be steel or could be timber. Yeah. But yeah, basically, as of now, in most cases, we use uh, traditional structure integrated within our walls. So. Yeah. So, so we can do both, right? So if we, if we uh, design a wall in such a way that it is actually load bearing, yeah, um, yeah. it is absolutely able to do that, but you would have to get it tested, broken, oh, yeah. tested, broken, you get a report and then it's, it's good. And yeah. then you can build with it. Um, however, we choose to just print formwork and use traditional sizes of columns and beams, uh, reinforced concrete that we pour in those uh, formwork printed yeah. uh, areas to to comply with every building code you can find pretty much. And yeah, that's, exactly. That's our way to avoid having to test and retest every structure yeah. we make. Well, it can be done. But... Yeah, yeah, and this depends really, of course, on the scope of the project. Like uh, using a traditional system allow us to scale our technology and our system internationally. So complying with different codes. Of course, uh, if we want to use the bearing structures as 3D printed, there needs to be some, some testing that can be done indeed. Yeah. But depends on the project. Um, let's see, any other questions? I think it was something up or? Um, Sarah, we require a frame in California. Um, could you elaborate on your question or is that a request because if it's a request sender then i would love for you to get in, in touch with me um using the contact form and we could talk about this if it's more of a question i would kindly ask you to reframe it because i don't understand yes sandra you can actually hire us uh, to design that's why we have the brilliant minds like leo <laughs> um so yeah if, if you have a question about that please feel free to contact me um yeah yeah it's not thing so please contact me we'll get in touch and we can see uh, what we can do for you yeah no problem at all healthy how about the foundation of the house uh, if earthquakes happen is the house strong so yeah the the foundation can be the the formwork for that can be printed and then it can be poured with uh, uh normal concrete um and yeah earthquake wise you can maybe talk a little bit about that but it's pretty much if we use the beams and columns we adhere to those building codes, yeah right? exactly so. in the end we we try to refer to what's already there so what's already been tested and analyzed 
So that's a starting point. And of course, foundation can vary based on soil, based on specific yeah, requirements, for example, earthquakes indeed. So um, most, yeah, there is, there's gonna be resistance for that, but it's gonna come most probably as of now from traditional foundation systems. Yeah. On top of which 3D printed walls, 3D printed structures are gonna be fixed. So yeah. yeah. So and we have been building in, uh, I believe, Japan and in New Zealand, yeah, yeah, where, yeah, yeah. Where, which are places where earthquakes do come into play. So we do have some experience with that. Yeah. Um, another question from France: Is do you use topology optimization software to improve load bearing capacity or thermal yeah. acoustic performances on the walls? That's okay. a mouthful, but <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, really interesting topic as well. So as we were explaining, uh, we rely on traditional structural system of, most of the time. So these projects I've been showing you today really, yeah, don't make use of topology optimization for any structural purpose. Of course, we are looking and we are always constantly developing. We have our standard systems and then we have innovations and that's always they're boiling within our, our company. And yeah, indeed, we look at optimization for thermal and acoustic performances mostly more than structural right now in it. Yeah. All right, so I see Mohammed has a question. If you please, I tried to sell the ID in Egypt, but my big problem is the cost wise. So Mohammed, is it the cost of the production or are you not sure how you could save cost building uh, with 3D printing or is the cost of the printer? Um, and all of this, um, you could elaborate here, but if you want, we could also get in touch, uh, like I said to Sandra, please just contact me. I will get a, a mail going and a conference call, just a one-on-one -on -one, uh, to talk about these things. Um, but we do have some quite good business cases to actually help you save costs. So we'll probably have a way to figure that out for you. No problem. Um, uh, I see a yes already. Uh, also, Sarah, Ed, I cannot find your YouTube channel. Please put the location in chat. Uh, that's already been done as well. All right, perfect. I hope I didn't miss anyone. If I did, um, yes, sir. Sarah already got answered okay, by yes, okay. sir. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that's it, right? If I did miss someone, I'm very sorry, guys. Uh, please just get in touch with me. I will be on laptop, not 24 7, but I'll be there on that loud. So you, you probably don't have to wait for a reaction very long. Um, let's see. How do you guys connect the walls with each other? That's also one for you. Right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah. One yeah, so um, uh, as we were saying, the structural structural frame of the time is realized traditional. So this consists of a series of, of course, vertical columns and beads and a foundation. This already provides a frame. So then it's about realizing partitions between them, which are connected, of course, because the, whatever like frame is going to be placed within the walls. And yeah, that, that's gonna provide the structural connection in any way. Interior walls, even if they're not within the frame, can be connected using uh, anchors similar to facade anchors. And then what's, uh, what's left, it's the air and water tightness. For that, we use standard products, standard connections, just about, just to basically, yeah, seal the connection between the two, the two different walls. All right. So it's again, looking at standard details. Um, let's see, can I make wool with thickness of 15 centimeters, not more or less? Yeah, I think yes, yeah. yes, so I was already answered that in the chat, like the width of the walls is of course, as I was explaining today, a parameter, like, uh, I don't know, any other parameter we've been discussing. So of course that can be changed. It will depend on the local requirements. So uh, that can be affected by things such as the structural required dimension or if there are requirements in terms of thermal insulation, for example. So that is something that can be evaluated, but yeah, on a, generally speaking, it can be reduced. Yeah. Yeah. And questions like this, please don't hesitate to contact us yeah. via mail as well, because we do have some quite nice documentation on, on our wall principles on how we connect, how we build. So just feel free to ask about those things and we can send you the documents. Um, I would, however, like to ask if you could um, send us uh, an email with the question, so then I can respond accordingly, because if I have to respond 
with email on these chats, then I might miss someone. So please send me an email and I'll definitely get back to you. All right, that's it for our Q&A. Well, like we talk, uh, talked about during this webinar, uh, our library is the way that we share our knowledge uh, because sharing is caring and we do think that the success of our knowledge helps our customers succeed and also helps the entire industry move forward. Um, so that's why we share our knowledge, a lot of it. Um, and we do that via a library. So um, we already said that the webinars can be found on there. Um, some courses, some trainings. Um, we even have some models like Leo just told you. Uh, and a big part of that is all free. So please feel free to check out our library. It's on the, on our website. And I think yes, it might be putting the link to that in the chat now as well for your reference. Um, so yeah, that's our way to kind of give back to the community about what we've learned in the couple, last yeah, yeah. nine years, I think we're working on this now. Oh yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So almost 10 years of knowledge in there. So feel free to check it out. Um, with that being said, um, I would like to thank everyone for attending today. Um, what we will do is uh, send an evaluation um, because this was our, our first yeah. time. Um, so we're very curious about what you thought of the webinar um, and we'll give you an evaluation form that you can fill out. Don't be too harsh on us. We no, did our best. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in that you can all, always uh, give tips for maybe subjects for the ne uh, next webinar. Um, if you have something that you're very curious about, let us know there and we we'll, might be able to make a, a webinar out of it. Yeah. All right. That's it from us. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you, guys. Everyone.